Thank you, Ruth, for such a kind introduction and the invitation to be a speaker here. Uh, when I started preparing for this talk, I realized that many of us all throughout the year has been lecturing and listening to experts on various aspects of the history of the first hundred years of GIA. So my first task was how can I keep this different while still sticking to the boundary conditions. I plan to do this by concentrating on physics rather than history in this lecture. And I will mention historical facts only when it is directly relevant to a physical issue. I also decided that I will make choices for you. I will begin with a bit of a background. At least some of you would not have seen before. And then I will talk about three clear tests of gravity, two areas in which gravity at general relativity made major impact, and three major challenges GR faces today, and what future, future could be in store for this subject. Obviously, these choices as to three, two, and three may not be everybody's, but I believe most of you would agree with me. When you think of gravity, root, how do I make it go up? This, yes. Now it's talking to <laughs> Ah, okay, you got it. Stand. It just so brought hard. So let me begin with the fact which everybody notices, the gorgeous elegance of general theory of relativity. And of many things which has been said about GR, this is my most favorite quote. When you read this quote, first thing which strikes you is that it is nothing extraordinary. Many people have said the same thing in much more poetic way. So why do I think this is the most important quote in case of general relativity? For that, you should know where it came from. It came from volume two of Landau and Lefschetz classical theory of fields. These guys don't waste a single word in empty LF1. The fact that when they came up to GR, they were forced to stop and put in a completely vacuous statement which has no physics content, tells you how beautiful general theory of relativity is. This is probably the highest price general theory of relativity could have got in my mind. Why is it so beautiful? It is so beautiful because he just took two principles and from that concluded that gravity is the curvature of space time. And it is worth remembering it once again in this occasion. What we know from special theory of relativity is that if you have a reference clock which measures a time dtr and you have a clock which moves a distance dx when this reference clock shows a time dtr, then the clock time shown by the moving clock is given by this. This is precisely why we put a minus sign in order to get that time dilation. This is independent of how the clock moves. So let us take the clock and put it in an elevator or a rocket ship which is going up with a motion g, acceleration g. This formula is still applicable and we get from principle of equivalence that what happens here should happen here. So we have just combined special theory of relativity and principle of equivalence. And lo and behold, in special theory of relativity, I would have written the velocity of the particle or the clock like this. And by principle of equivalence, there is an equivalent gravitational field to it. What happens here must happen here, which means that clocks have to run slower in gravitational field. With elementary algebra, you then get this result that the clock time or the proper time should have this formula. If we take this as the sacred principle, it immediately follows that this is a curved space time. This is, of course, where the, what was alluded to previously as the speed of light being variable, et cetera, et cetera. But it is obvious that this space time mathematically represents a curved space time. And this tells you 
that the gravitational potential eventually has to be replaced by a metric tensor. After all the uh, heartbreaking trials with gamma covariance, et cetera, et cetera, this is the conclusion Einstein reached. And in fact, Pauli in his article points out that this fusion of metric and gravitation is probably the most beautiful achievement of DR, and uh, one couldn't uh, agree more. This next task, of course, is having obtained how the geometry tells the matter to move, we need to know how the matter tells the geometry to curve. Now, that is the field equations of general relativity, and it took a lot of time for Einstein to get it, mainly because he was looking at the energy momentum tensor as the source, and that is the way we teach kids even today. But there's a much nicer and simpler way to look at it. With hindsight, it is rather obvious. What did Newton tell us? Newton told us that del square phi is rho, and special relativity tells you that rho should be replaced by the energy density of matter. And it is obvious that you cannot write down the energy density of matter bringing, without bringing in an observer. So here is the four velocity of the observer. And this should be the right-hand side. In the right-hand side, left-hand side, we have already said that the potential is like metric. So we have second derivatives of the metric, which is curvature. But it has only spatial ablation. So maybe we should look at the spatial part of the curvature. And dimension-wise, this has one by length square, which means that we are looking at some radius of curvature of the space-time, and it's uh, inverse square. So the most obvious field equation would be the radius of curvature of the space, not space-time, orthogonal to the observer, should be proportional to the energy density measured by just that observer. Translate that into mathematics. Given any observer with a four velocity, there is something called a projection tensor with two indices, which projects the indices to a space orthogonal to that four velocity. Take the curvature tensor project it and get this tensor, and there is only one scalar you can form out of it. It so happens that it has this value, but that is not really relevant. Physically, what is relevant is that you take this curvature, the radius of curvature, and you equate it to energy density. This single scalar equation contains the 10 equations of Einstein, because this equation is supposed to hold for every observer. And the left-hand side is just this, and right-hand side is this, and if it has to hold for all UA, you need this 2 GAB equal to uh, TA. So Einstein's field equation essentially tells you that the energy density as measured by any observer curves the space, not space-time, in a particular way that this equation holds. And uh, this is what Einstein did end up finally even though he wrote it as uh, tensorial equations, as we teach people today. But I believe this gives you the physical content much better. Now, immediately after the uh, discovery of general theory of relativity, there were three key new effects which came into being. Out of several effects, I have decided to select these three. The first one, the precession of mercury, was something which Einstein was using when he was writing down various uh, field equations and testing it out, it was already known that there is this value, and the final general theory of relativity did verify that. Interestingly enough, the first attempt was with the wrong field equation because he was looking at matter which are trace free. So he got something like Rik equals zero, Rik equals zero. And he also didn't think that anyone is going to solve these field equations exactly. So he used the approximate first order metric, and that was good enough to make this prediction. Interestingly enough, the first exact solution came just a few months after uh, GR was achieved, and in fact, a few months before Carl Schwarzschild unfortunately died. However, though it was discovered just a few months after, it took enormous amount of time to understand the physics behind the short sale metric. I would say that it was understood finally only in the 60s, and mainly because of issues of coordinate system. In those days, Einstein and Schwarzschild were trying to write down space time in which the determinant tensor is unity. So here is a metric 
it actually happens to be flat space time. Written in a coordinate system where the determinant tensor, determinant of the metric tensor is unity. What Schwarzschild did was to modify this to a form introducing three functions. Effectively, this is what he did, which satisfies this constraint. And obviously, when you write down the solution in this kind of a coordinate system, first of all, it looked like it was non-singular at the origin. And uh, even today, you get a paper to referee occasionally where somebody claims that Schwarzschild metric is not singular at the origin, just because of this reasons of this kind. And there are also people who claim it is singular at r is equal to 2m, but that has sort of gone away. So both these confusions existed at the simplest possible solution. But why did Einstein think that an exact solution is going to be so horribly complicated that he didn't even attempt it? This is mainly because Einstein's theory is a nonlinear theory, and um, nonlinear differential equations are notoriously difficult to solve. But it just so happens, again, something which is not emphasized in the textbook. There is one special case when Einstein's theory becomes linear. And that is exactly this case. If you consider metrics of the form where you have a 1 plus 2 pi here and a 1 plus 2 pi here and it is static, sold by an energy density and some transverse pressure. And if you write down Einstein's equation, it turns out that the equations are linear in part just like Newtonian equation. And you can write down the most general solution for phi at one go. If you add row one, row two, row three, row four, you just keep adding them. And this is exactly the reason why you can start with Schwarzschild metric, go to resonant nostrum metric, then you can add a cosmological constant, et cetera, et cetera. The equation actually becomes linear in this case. And indirectly, that is the reason Schwarzschild could solve that almost immediately. Now let us go back to the second effect, which was predicted, which is the bending of flat. And here is a famous telegram from Einstein, uh, Eddington to Einstein after 1919. And here are uh, just one sample of a newspaper headline. Sociologists often wonder why Einstein became overnight famous after this 1919 confirmation. To a great extent, it apparently has to do with the end of First World War and the kind of uh, kind of pacifist uh, ideas which were prevalent just after that. And uh, it is not very clear to me whether that is the reason. But it is certainly true that Einstein became very, very famous after this results were announced, even though very few people, according to this tall wise man, who understood the implications of the result. But what is important to us today, of course, is that what was considered to be a very small effect which is like arc seconds of deflection. It's a very large effect today. Radio astronomers routinely work with milli arc seconds and micro arc seconds. So bending of light, which was thought to be a small effect, is a huge effect. Here is one example of the way, this is essentially the bending parameter, which is narrowed down here and to very tiny value, coming from the kind of error bars which we had originally here. But what is really important probably is that the bending of light is behind the one of the spectacular observational tools in modern cosmology, that of gravitational lensing. Again, it is historically rather interesting that Einstein did think about this. And he says that in order to get an engineer who was persuading him to publish a minor calculation of his, uh, he did publish it in 1936. He looked at the bending of light by star and said that it is of little value. One year, it's interesting to see how many times Einstein got things wrong. Okay, it is one year later, Swicky wrote this paper. It's a beautiful paper. It is a single one-page paper. It's a visionary paper. If you can write one-page paper which tells you this, you are doing great. It is, in fact, less than one page in physical review. In that paper, he worked with galaxies, found the bending angle, and just said three, three paragraphs. It can be used to test relativity. It will magnify faint objects. It can measure the distribution of masses. And that is exactly what we have been doing here. It's amazing. And uh, in case you haven't seen this paper, you should go and read this. It's beautifully written. And uh, here is one like, recent example of, from Dark Energy Survey, uh, the science verification data. 
where you are actually mapping the heaven using the weak lensing. And you can see concentrations at various places, etc. I just picked one random example out of many. Let us go further. The third major prediction was, of course, the gravitational wave emission. Here again, Einstein got it wrong first. Rosen and Einstein wrote a paper claiming that gravitational waves do not exist. Fortunately, US of A had this concept of refereeing papers. The paper went to, which apparently was not there in Germany for Einstein's paper. Some historian should correct me if that is really true. This was refereed by Robertson, and he pointed out that the paper was wrong. And um, I'm told that Einstein never sent another paper to physical review D after that. But he did correct, and the correct paper by Rosen and Einstein, of course, said that gravitational waves exist. And today we have beautiful results from the 1913-16 Pulsar, as well as many others, which verifies that gravitational wave emission is a reality. Of course, we haven't seen it in the lab, and there are huge efforts going on, and it would be fun to detect them in the lab. But there is no doubt whatsoever that it is really there, and here is an enlargement of this region. This particular system has sufficient amount of redundancy that you can plot curves and insist that they all go through one point, and the narrowness over which it overlaps is what tells you how beautifully the theory, uh, theory is verified. One way of looking at it is to measure the masses of the two binaries and use that to predict the speed out and the observations and the general latestic prediction uh, agree to a remarkable accuracy. So this is a picture again, uh, the Nobel Prize winning picture, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And uh, this tells you one more prediction of Einstein's theory, remarkably verified in astrophysics. In addition to these, I would say that there are two major areas in astrophysics where gravity has made an undeliable mark. The first is the role of black holes in astrophysics, and second, of course, is the cosmic expansion and the dynamics of the universe. Let us take the black holes first. This has some special relevance to the Texas Symposia, because in the first Texas Symposia, you know, Thomas Gold made a very famous comment which to a certain extent is true even today, that the relatives suddenly find that they are experts in a field, namely astrophysics, which they hardly knew existed. Okay. And the, to, to a major aspect of this, the credit should go to the black hole. And there are two ranges of monsters in which black holes play a role here. One is the supermassive black holes, like 10 to the 9 solar mass, which powers all the AGN. And we believe that virtually every galaxy hosts such a black hole, including our own galaxy. And the other is the superstellar mass black holes, which appear in X-ray binaries. Both the black holes are expected to be rotating, and definitely these ones. And that brings us to probably the second most beautiful solution. Third, second probably is the Friedman equation solution. The third most beautiful solution we have for Einstein's theory, namely the Kerr matrix. It's obvious that this solution took some time coming just from the complications which are involved in that. But the main feature is that there is an extra angular momentum parameter which characterizes the rotation of the black hole by J by M. So this looks reasonably complicated and reasonably abstract, but astronomers are brave souls, and uh, they have plans to measure this spin parameter of the black holes in the sky. So this is one among uh, many such observations. I again picked something at random. And this is also not as well established as the relativists would like to be. There are some controversies involved in modeling these, et cetera. But it's just a question of time before we actually see a thermetric in the sky and measure its uh, spin uh, angular momentum parameter, which is, of course, the main uh, characteristic feature of a rotating black hole. Now let me go on to the second area of uh, influence, namely the expanding universe. As regards the expansion of the universe, in some sense it is a missed opportunity by Einstein. It would have been wonderful if you write down a few equations in a sheet of paper, solve them, and predict 
that the universe is expanding. And tell your experimental colleagues to go and look for it. Good old Albi missed the chance. Uh, he got cold feet, tinkered with his equations. Equations are often wiser than those who create them. And forgetting that, he tinkered with the equations and went for a steady state model and had to finally come back. There is this very famous quote coming from George Gamow's uh, uh, World Line, my World Line book, saying that Einstein called the introduction of the cosmological constant as his biggest blunder. I'm not completely certain what Einstein meant there, and there are other things in that book which are not completely factual and mildly exaggerated. So it is probable that Einstein meant missing this opportunity for human civilization, missing being able to predict the expansion of the universe from a few equations written in the back of the envelope. That opportunity, which was missed, as his greatest blunder in his life. Of course, he introduced the cosmological constant to do that, but the real thing is that it was missed. But whatever it may be, in recent years, we have made tremendous progress in this. And today, observations are way ahead of theoretical understanding of our universe. We know a lot about the universe, we understand very little. And these are the kind of observations which we have all seen. And if you put all these things together, we get a very strange view of our universe. It looks like there were vacuum fluctuations in the very fluid phase of the universe. This is my attempt to caricature a vacuum fluctuation. And which led to these beautiful things which we see in CMBR, the temperature and isotropy. And if you run it forward, you can produce the cosmic structures which we see today. There is a broad, consistent paradigm and a picture which exists, but it requires a very strange evolutionary history for the universe. Here I have plotted in the standard model which we believe today, how the cosmic density of the universe varies with the size of the universe. We must have one phase which is an inflationary phase where the density is almost constant, a pure number. And then there was a match radiation and matter dominated epoch. And there is an epoch at which the radiation and matter densities were equal. That is again characterized by another density, another pure number. And then at very late time, we are going into the phase dominated by the cosmological constant. In my mind, dark energy is essentially the cosmological constant. So the overall density does something like this. And this value depends on unknown physics at inflationary scale. This depends on the amount of dark matter and the kind of uh, dark matter candidate which we have. And this depends on the cosmological constant. These are the three parameters which I will call the signature of our universe. Normally, cosmologists for convenience would describe a universe in terms of parameters like Hubble constant, omega matter, omega radiation, etc., etc. But these are numbers which are very firmly tied down to the current epoch. If you have a galaxy at a redshift of six and a planetary system in a star system around that, and you have intelligent cosmologists who are doing cosmology there, they would have used different parameterization for their Hubble constant, omega parameter, etc. But those guys would have got exactly the same numbers for these three. So there are three densities which characterizes our universe. And these are epoch independent. These are just numbers which you can measure and determine in principle. And then the evolutionary history is given by just these two equations. This is what happens during inflationary phase. And later on, it goes like this. This is just a mathematical characterization of what I have plotted here with these three densities. So if you look at these, observationally, we know two of them fairly well. This is rho eq, and this is rho lambda. Today's observation determined them to a great value. We do not know uh, what this row inflation is, but we have bounds and we believe it is somewhere over here. This is the observational situation. Theoretically, however, we sort of understand these two, or at least we have a way of thinking about them. High energy physics will probably eventually determine this value and this value once we know what dark matter candidate is. But we have absolutely no idea what this quantity is. Where does this cosmological constant spring from? 
That brings me to the uh, third part of my talk. What are the three, what are the major challenges which general relativity faces today? Major conceptual challenges. Looking at which we can proceed further. The first one is what I would call the singularities. I will describe it in a minute. And second is the cosmological constant. And third is what I would call the thermodynamic connection. So let us go through this. The singularity is, it is sort of captured by this beautiful quote from John Wheeler, is a very practical problem rather than an abstract theoretical one. Suppose there is a star which is collapsing, and uh, all of us have colleagues whom we would like to persuade to sit on such a star, and suppose you manage to get one of these guys to sit on that, and he would like to know what is going to happen to him when the time which he is, the, the clock which he is carrying shows a particular value. Today we cannot predict that. Today we have to say that I can predict it up to a particular time. At that time my theory breaks down, I do not know what happens next. So in a very practical sense, the theory fails at that point. We believe that it is probably has something to do with the effect happening at uh, Planck scale, but we do not know. The second issue, which is the problem of the cosmological constant. There are many ways of looking at it, and I would like to present it in a very simple and uh, in a manner in which I believe we can hope for some understanding. If you take the matter sector of the theory and you add a constant to the Lagrangian or to the Hamiltonian, that is if you shift the zero level of the energy, the matter sector is invariant. Gravity, the so-called very beautiful, gorgeously elegant theory, breaks this symmetry. Gravity is not invariant under the addition of a constant to the Hamiltonian, which is closely related to the cosmological constant problem. But at the same time, it seems to be completely unaffected by changes in the zero level of the energy during the phase transitions in the, as the universe evolved. And what is more, it seems to couple to a very small cosmological constant in today's era. Even though it is, it is, breaks this symmetry, it chooses a particular value for this lambda, which is enormously tiny. The question is why? And this is probably one of the greatest theoretical challenges which we face today. The third, which is often not emphasized to astrophysical audience, and that is why I decided to throw it in is this deep connection between space-time dynamics and thermodynamics. Probably the most beautiful result which we have today in the interface of uh, gravity and quantum theory is that if you have an observer in any space-time who cannot access part of the space-time, he will attribute a temperature to that space-time, which is related to the acceleration of the observer or to acceleration which can be geometrically characterized. This allows you at one go to introduce a heat density to the space time. Just as if you take a glass of water, at any given point I can associate a temperature and entropy density and hence a heat density. Observers, a special class of observers, can attribute to the space time any event a heat density. Now this is something which all of you would have known in the context of black holes, but this result transcends all those things. In any given space time, there exists observers who will attribute a particular uh, uh, heat density to the space time. This arises because at any given event, if you have a freely falling observer, and you have an observer who is sitting quietly following this trajectory, the vacuum fluctuations of the fields in left hand side appear as thermal fluctuations in the right hand side. Now the question is, why does space time exhibit such thermal properties? So in my mind, these are the three most important challenges which are faced by general theory of relativity. So all the three of them has a head cross in it, so it seems reasonable that the solution to these depend on putting together the principles of quantum theory and gravity. Now I never believed it, my colleagues used to tell me that everybody wants to quantize gravity. And I finally believed it when I came to know that Anna Hathaway, the famous Hollywood star, is very much interested in this problem. And uh, she says that she is very much interested in understanding string theory as well as understanding 
how space and time exist in the universe, etc., etc. So quantum gravity is something which is desiredly very popular and desiredly many people are working on it. However, nobody has succeeded, including Anna Hathaway, in uh, quantizing gravity. The reason is, in some sense, threefold. First of all, the most successful way we can approach quantum theory today, quantum field theory today, is perturbative, and uh, perturbative, and we do not have a perturbative approach for gravity. So it is probably okay because. Virtually every interesting question about gravity which you would like to ask, how did the universe got created, what happens at the end stage of the black hole, etc., etc., are non perturbative by nature. And what is more, there is no single guiding principle which we have, and just because metric satisfies the second order differential equation in classical gravity, we assume it is a quantum variable and try to quantize this. So given this, what is going to happen in the next 100 years? So I would like to share my vision as to how these problems possibly could be attacked. And uh, essentially, we need yet another paradigm shift. So this paradigm shift, I can state it most simply by this statement. You can read more about it here. One can prove that if gravity has to be immune to the zero level of the energy, and all observations are that gravity is immune to the zero level of the energy, then one can show that it must have a thermodynamic interpretation. This provides a connection between two of the three challenges which were considered most of the time as completely independent. The cosmological constant problem has a deep connection with the thermodynamic angle of gravity. If this is indeed true, then the classical gravity has the same conceptual status as elasticity or hydrodynamics. Just because in hydrodynamics you have a variable which satisfies the second order differential equation and you go and quantize it, you are not going to understand the atomic nature of space, atomic nature of matter. So in the same way, this is probably not the right way to approach gravity. And the best thing which we can do today is to study space-time dynamics exactly the way physicists study fluid before knowing the atomic structure of matter. There the key concept was from Boltzmann. He told you that you don't have to run angstrom scale experiments to understand that a glass of water contains atoms. You just keep it in a kettle. If you can heat water, it must have microstructure to store energy. He also gave you a formula. He told you that if you are to store this much of energy at this temperature, you need this many degrees of freedom. Now we know that you can heat up space time. So reversing this logic, you can actually count the microscopic space-time degrees of freedom. You can write down a distribution function for atoms of space-time. And using this distribution function, you can go further. It determines, just like in thermodynamics, the entropy density of the space-time. And what you do is to go and maximize this entropy density plus the entropy density of matter in the space time. Just to remind you, this entropy density is more precisely should be thought of as the heat density, which is, uh, which is essentially T times the entropy density. It is this heat density which distinguishes the uh, point particle mechanics from thermodynamics. And you, you can write down a variational principle involving the heat density of gravity and heat density of matter, and if you expand that, you end up getting the theories of the, the, uh, the field equations of gravity. However, it is completely incongruous if you say that gravity is like a thermodynamics of the system and you finally end up getting Einstein field equations. Einstein field equations are geometrical, they are not thermodynamic. When you do this, you actually get the field equations in a thermodynamical language. Here, what happens is that the gravity responds to the heat density and not to the energy density, and that is why it doesn't couple to the cosmological constant. Nevertheless, when you work out the theory, you find that the cosmological constant arises as an integration constant, and its value is actually determined by a new conserved quantity we have in the universe. So the field equation, just for those of you who want to see that, looks like this. There is a left-hand side which can be interpreted either as a time evolution of space-time or heating and cooling of space-time. And that 
is related to degrees of freedom in a surface and in the volume of a region. And when they are equal, the space-time remains static. This single equation, which should hold for all surfaces in space, replaces the field equation of gravity. It is implied by and implies Einstein's field equation. In the case of cosmology, this equation is remarkably simple. If you take the Hubble radius of the universe, dr by dt in the kind of accelerating universes which we have is just given by 1 minus n bulb by n cell. I told you a little earlier that this is the strange behavior of our universe. In this language, it is just going from one equipartition phase where n surface is equal to n bulb to another one. This is unstable, this is stable, and it is transiting through this region. What is more, it carries information about the degrees of freedom in these two phases. And you can actually count these degrees of freedom. You can count them theoretically, and in some suitable units, it just happens to be 4 pi. It is a surface area of a unit sphere, 4 pi. And you can measure them observationally. Once you know that, the connection between this phase and this phase allows you to determine the cosmological constant. Here is the formula for the cosmological constant. I told you that in the conventional theory, these three densities are completely independent. In this particular paradigm, in which you think of gravity as a thermodynamic limit of atoms of space-time, you have a relation between these three densities. They are no longer arbitrary in our universe. And it has this beautiful number, exponential 36 pi square, which brings down this large value to the kind of value you need here. Theoretically, once high energy physicists get their act together and give me these two numbers, I can tell you what the cosmological constant is. But today, observationally, we know rho eq and rho lambda, but we do not know rho inflation. So this model, which puts together principles of quantum gravity, quantum theory and gravity, it's probably the only, in fact, it is the only model which gives you a falsifiable prediction. Given this and this, I can work backward, and I find that inflation should have taken place at this range. If biceps-like experiments tomorrow tells me that inflation went out of this range, there are no fudge factors here. I have only 36 and 5 square and 4 and 27. If it goes outside this range, this model is wrong. So this probably should be what I have called the take-home first message of this talk. And I believe the future would require a paradigm shift. When we look at the space-time as the thermodynamic limit of atoms of space-time, and unlike other models of quantum theory of gravity, it can lead to testable prediction in cosmology. Just to conclude, let me summarize. Uh, my opinion about what a beautiful theory in physics should do. First of all, it should have great elegance and beauty, which Einstein's general relativity definitely has. It should make testable predictions, by which I mean numbers, which observers can hit at, not abstract theoretical mumbo jumbo. Einstein's theory does give you numbers. I gave you three examples of that. And third, in some sense equally important, is that the theory should raise new questions. It should allow you to see connections which you would not have seen earlier, and it should allow for you to go along new paths so that the theoretical frontier can be extended. And in the last part of the talk, I have shared with you my vision as to how GR fulfills this promise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanu, for this fascinating view of general relativity and where to go on. Are there questions? Yes? You can switch on your mic now. Uh, this theory, can we apply this theory on black holes? And if we, can we apply this last theory on black holes? And if so, what uh, this constant or variables can be in a black hole? 
No, this particular application is essentially for cosmology because it uses a conserved quantity which runs through these three phases of the universe. The theoretical formulation can be used for black holes, like, uh, let me get back to this. Yeah, this one, where it tells you how a black hole dynamic should evolve. It should be interpreted as you take a surface, there are degrees of freedom living on the surface, there are degrees of freedom living on the pulse, and the difference between these two degrees of freedom, number of degrees of freedom, is what drives the evolution of the black hole. You can do that, and uh, we have been trying to attack the singularity problem. I gave you the three problems, and singularity problem I didn't talk about. This approach seems to suggest that there is a quiescent phase at Planck radius but that is still not completely done. But in principle, you can apply that. Other questions? There is a hand somewhere over there. Yes, please. So, the one of the table you presented for black hole mass and spin relation. Sorry, I, I can't. Uh, uh, one of the table you presented for black hole mass and spin relation. Yes. So, is it a general trend that um, higher the black hole mass, uh, higher the spin from the table, it seems yes, so. Yes, yes, yes. Go on. So, so you're asking, is it true? Yeah, is it a general trend for all the cases? Like it, well, I'm not very sure about that, and there are people in the audience who are more experts in this area than I am. But to the extent I could uh, make out from the literature, there is a lot of uncertainties in modeling these systems. There are many people who would even question some of the entries in that case. If there are no more questions, let's thank Tanu again.